as part of education for women that are trying to get pregnant, those are some of the issues. Instead of just talking about macronutrients, which you are interested in, uh, because it could have a lot of um, benefit if they take them. We think that understanding um, your diabetes status or your blood sugar level before getting pregnant is important. You need to control that before you get pregnant because you want to have a healthy, a better outcome. And uh, if they develop it during pregnancy, that is also need to be controlled. But if you control, uh, if you are obese, it also increases your risk of becoming diabetic. So that is a problem. So uh, educating women to actually, if they can reduce their weight, it's hard, you know, reducing weight is really very hard. But if they look at, if they see that that's something they can do or they're willing to do before they get pregnant, it has benefit for the mother, they also have benefit for the child that they will love, right? So that is something trying to reduce weight and then uh, controlling blood sugar level uh, is important before pregnancy and during pregnancy. This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories podcast, episode number 96. Hi everyone, Omar Richards here. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Before anything, be sure to follow me on Instagram at the PH Millennial. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast if you have not as yet. Definitely want you all to subscribe and leave a five-star review. Let me know what you think about the podcast. It greatly helps me, helps the show get out to other people. And along that vein, be sure to share this with someone else who you think might get some value from this story or another story of the podcast. And just lots of other great information coming out. Um, if you'd like to support, you can go to the phmillennial.com, follow slash support, and find different ways to support there. But I really enjoyed today's episode. I really like how this guest breaks down the simplicity of the importance of investing in putting on child health and ensuring that children and their mothers are healthy. And there was something that's very interesting for me that I learned today was around the the blood categorization of people during their, their cycle, their period cycle, and how that changes and the implications that might have for when your clinician is looking at you during pregnancy and taking different like vital levels or whatever the case might be, which I thought was very interesting. Um, but I enjoyed today's episode and I, I hope you all do too. A lot of great insights and a, a lot of great information. So enjoy and I will see you all next week. Today we have someone whose research focuses on maternal and child health with a particular interest in methods to optimize measurement micronutrient status in pregnancy, obesity, and global health. He has conducted maternal and child health research in Ghana and the US. He obtained his bachelor's degree in nutrition and food science from the University of Ghana. He then went on to get his master's of science in nutrition also from the University of Ghana. He worked as a faculty member at the University for Development Studies in Ghana before getting his PhD in Nutritional Sciences from Pennsylvania State University. He currently is a postdoctoral research associate at Iowa State University. We have Dr. Sixtus Agaru, PhD. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Omari, for welcoming me to your program. It is, it is my pleasure. I'm glad to have like a bunch of varied stories on, on the podcast. And uh, I, I know that yours is going to be different from most of the others that, that I've had before. So, so I'm glad to have you. So tell me, how, how are you doing and how you've been coping during these times? I would say I'm doing good. Um, so far uh, with the pandemic and all that, but life has not stopped. We have, we try to be uh, positive and we are waiting for the pandemic to be final over and to get back to normal normal life. Yeah, yeah. That, I know all of us here and listening to this or watching this this podcast definitely feels that same way, especially people that have been in public health and have been dealing with uh, the the ever-going issues that, that uh, plague our lives to this day. But yeah, we definitely are seeing some positives and hopefully we do get to, to a more normal sometime very, very soon. Um, so, so tell me, how do you identify and then tell us a little bit about your personal background? So I identify as a he, him and his, 
Um, my name is Sixtus Agre. So I'm from Ghana originally. And uh, I, I was born and raised in Ghana. I uh, had my education uh, from undergrad to master's and then had some research and teaching experience from Ghana. Uh, and because I was working in the area of public health, I became interested in how can we actually improve maternal and child health. And that brought me into the US to study nutrition, uh, uh, nutritional sciences at the Pennsylvania State University. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. I'm definitely gonna gonna dive more into that a little bit later on. So before we get into your story and how you got into schooling, what does public health mean to you? So public health, uh, there are different ways to define it. There's a classical definition, but uh, what I want to focus on it. Uh, how people see health. So health, public health, looking at the health of your community and then your family. How do we uh, live healthy? So public, so public has to do with a lot of people. So we are trying to improve the health of people. So that could be nutrition, it could be uh, food, pro food, nutrition problem, food problem, or disease and infections, these are all part of public health broadly. So with my, uh, my area, I'm more interested in the nutritional aspect of public health. So if you have a lot of children that are born that are malnourished, it's a public health problem. If you have a lot of people that are obese, it's a public health problem because these can all contribute to affect how the society uh, actually function. So you want to have healthy people and the healthy people, you have a healthy society. So that is uh, the, uh, the aspect I'm coming from. How do we improve nutrition and then the people will be healthy? Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you for sharing that. And I, and I like how, how you added your own personal perspective around uh, maternal and child health. And, and I think it is it's so important because as, as we know, just focusing on improving people's health just gives them better access to, to opportunities and, and allows them to just live a more wholesome and better quality of life um, that, than they would have otherwise. So, so I appreciate you doing that. So you got your bachelor's of science uh, in nutritional sciences and food sciences at the University of Ghana. What was the thought process for you going into this degree? That's interesting. So when I was in high school, I love math, math and, and physics. So my interest was in the num dealing with numbers. So I initially wanted to do engineering. But when I went to uh, the university, uh, I sat in a nutrition, introductory nutrition class. And it was really interesting uh, how nutrition can contribute to improving the health of people. So uh, in the introductory nutrition, it's a broad concept, just drawing upon the big issue in nutrition. So and from there, I said, well, this is really like something I want to do. Wouldn't it be good instead of inject injecting people with pills if we can use food to solve the problems? So that drew me into nutrition. So that's how, how come I moved from thinking of doing engineering, then uh, I got to college, and then all of a sudden I wanted to do nutrition and food science. Uh, because I just saw that it had a lot of potential to make population healthy. And uh, I, I was during the my, my time in college, I got involved in a lot of program, uh, volunteering program. And I thought that having work in communities, uh, nutrition will be a good way to start uh, my career and to, that to have maximum impact in, in the community I come from. Okay. And going into university, were you thinking you wanted into you wanted to go into a career that was like helping people? You said you, you had to focus on engineering. But what, like, why why did this nutrition like capture capture your attention so much, and, and you wanted to get more into it? You know, I, I was fascinated by uh, uh, the uh, engineering, what they could do. So we were traveling on the road. You see the how the roads are constructed. That is a lot of thinking engineering that brought about that. If you sat in a car and you see that people have to design the structure uh, and then the braking system, all that, you learn that in physics. So that fascinated me. So I, I would, for, at that time, I was just fascinated by the whole field of engineering. So that was it. 
But as I entered college, then I started seeing the, the, what nutrition could do to community and the people around me, how I can use nutrition to impact their life. So that, that, that's how come I got drawn into nutrition aspect. Okay, okay, well, that, that's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you, you had that intro class and, and you got introduced to nutrition and, and you chose to, to pursue that that time. So while you were at the University of Ghana doing your bachelor's degree, you were a member of the National Disaster Management Organization. So tell, tell us a little bit about what that is and then how do you get in and what do you do with them? So the National Disaster Management Organization, it's a national program, as the name suggests. So if there is a disaster in the country, uh, so they respond to uh, the community. So like there's a, a fire outbreak in the community or there's a flooding. So they, they rush in there to see, assess the problem and see if they can provide them temporary relief, like accommodation, food, uh, beds, bedding material, all that. So that is what they do. Uh, and that is what many people also just know because that's what's seen on the TV and talk about on the radio. But beyond that, they also get involved in teaching people uh, how to uh, protect uh, their, their homes. For instance, uh, so I got involved because I just wanted to be part of something that I, I, I could learn besides just science, you know? So that was my first initial, uh, initial thought. Just doing something that had nothing to do with classroom stuff. So, but I realized that they taught her how to actually use the fire extinguisher like in the building and then personal safety. If we enter a building, the first thing I, I, I learned there was, you have to first look for the exit. When you enter a building, first thing, look for the exit. So those are things people don't normally think about because you assume everything will go well, but things do not always go well all the time. So first thing you enter a building, also look for where is the exit because there could be a, a need for you to leave the building at any moment, either there's a disaster or something. So those are some of the things that we learned. And so we, we actually taught other students, just educate them on some of the security issues they need to concern about. So that about security, your personal security is important. You have to first think about your security. Uh, the police are there to protect you, but you, have, you, have, you are responsible for your security. Because if you are, you, you are harmed and the police didn't come in any way to find the, 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 the culprit or the perpetrator, but the harm has already been caused. So you, you, be, you take caution to protect yourself. So st those are some of the things that we learned through uh, the National Disaster Management Programming. And so we also use the opportunity to teach other students just about security, to be conscious of your environment and uh, how to use the basic uh, fire extinguisher program that are common everywhere. So those were some of the things that I, I, I learned and I thought uh, they were really valuable. These are not things you can learn anywhere. I used to see the, the, them in, every, in the buildings, but really I didn't know how to use them, right? And I, I guess a lot of students would just see them hang around the corners of the building, but like they are of no use because the students don't know how to use them if there's a disaster. And if there is, you are in a building and there is a stampede, everybody's rushing and some don't even know where they pass out. And so there could be a disaster. So we want to prevent the disaster. We're not only managing disaster, but how do we present the, prevent the disaster from occurring? In that case, and that's, you hear about a lot of stampede happening in building and all that. So if people know what to do in the first place, then we can reduce uh, some of the, the, the harm that could come with uh, stampedes. So just knowing we are going to a new, uh, get to a new community, try to find out where the police station. Okay, so if there's a problem, where do I report it? Just try, whatever you're going to, just try to be conscious of some of the safety issues that you need to know. If you run into trouble, if you have a security number, emergency number, who do you call when you are in, in, in problem? Your phone should be accessible by other people because you could, you could have a phone, but yeah, you, you are an accident, but no, they don't know who to call. So all those were things that you learn through the National Disaster Management uh, Organization. You have an emergency number, everybody knows this number. This is why you call the person cannot talk or in an accident, so, or who is the relative. You need to have some of these basic information we as you go about so that if you are in trouble, you can help yourself. Or if you are not able to help yourself, somebody can use the information that you have with you to trace your family relative that could, that could save you. 
Okay, awesome. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And I wanted to highlight the point that you made that you went into this just because it was some something outside of like coursework. And, and I yes. think that that is important for people to know because we, we know that we get a lot of experience and like knowledge from coursework, but actually getting out and doing things is, is how we, we are able to like really solidify that leading and whatnot. And it sounds like you you did a lot of um, disaster management preparedness and like focusing on prevention on all the different levels from from pre issue or pre like pandemic or whatever the, the the issue might be whether it's a school shooting or whatever the case might be all the way up to like okay this is happening where are the exits where are the other things that I could think about at that point in time uh, so yeah. that, that's, that's definitely some some great work that you were able to do during your undergrad and and um also, you mentioned a little bit earlier that you did a lot of volunteering during your undergrad. What, what were some, some of the takeaways that you got from, from volunteering and, and doing that type of work? So I love teaching. So during uh, summer breaks, uh, I used to go to some of the high schools that are deprived. They do not have teachers. So just to go and teach. So I, I used to go and teach during summer. Just for I'm not just for free. I used to go and just for literary service. So I used to go and teach, stay there and teach until the school go on break. And then uh, we resume school in August, then I'll go back to school. So just teaching. Teaching was the main thing. But uh, you know, HIV2 is, is, is a very common problem in many countries. But uh, there were people who do not really understand the whole idea about HIV and they have a lot of cultural issues. And, and some people have a, the wrong perception about what actually causes HIV and all that. So I was involved in community education, uh, family planning, and the HIV AIDS prevention and, and, and resources that are available to them. So we go to the community and we, sometimes we distribute condoms and then um, just help people, help people to use them. And also talk about family planning because if the community, you do not have a lot of resources, and then the father has a lot of children, then it's become a burden on the family all uh, together. And that will affect the quality of life of the children. And so they are not able to send them to school uh, or give them the, the quality education that the kid need to, to, to prosper or to flourish in society. So just getting parents to understand that uh, uh, ha having the right to produce uh, children is good, but you want to give the children a better future. And if you want to give a better future to your children, you have to look at the resources that are available to you because they are, they, that is what you can control, what you have. And so you, you think about how many, of the, how many kids can I actually take care of and give them good education and take care of their health and so that they become uh, uh, very useful citizens to community and then to uh, the country. So those were some of the things that I was involved in. Sometimes talking to parents as individuals, and they're also being part of a group that do the education. Yeah, so uh, I, I really enjoy that so much. And some of the students, uh, I, I'll meet them in town and then they'll just come and just come and thank me for what I have done to them and that they have succeeded and they are in, in college now. But to be frank, I didn't even know most of them because they uh, just stayed there for like two, three months to teach. And by the student, they saw the impact that you made in their life and they recognize that. So they see you and they just come to, uh, to thank you for that. But I cannot put their name to faces because there are a lot of students and I taught different schools over, over time. So, but uh, those were some of the things besides the classroom work that I really enjoyed a lot. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that's awesome as well. And, and kudos for you for like taking the time to go and going out and helping like uh, less, less disadvantaged, more disadvantaged um, communities and, and people and educating. Were you always someone that loved teaching? Was that something that you learned throughout your bachelor's program that this was something that you, you loved doing or how, how did that work out? So I discovered that uh, actually much earlier. So I discovered that even in high school that I love to teach. And so uh, throughout high school, uh, I used to teach junior, uh, those before uh, junior high school, we call it junior high school in Ghana. That is before the high school. So I used to go and teach during vacation. And so when I uh, finished high school, I, I, I spent a whole year teaching high school. So that was just a voluntary work I was doing teaching students. So I did that for a year. So at the time I was in Ghana, uh, high school, you finish high school, you wait for one year before you go to college. So um, it was such that you write the exam, you have a national exam. 
actually is a yeah it's national exam so that you all the students in the country in high school will write that exam so you wait until the exam results are released and by the time they are released uh the the university admissions are already closed so you have to wait until the, the cycle open so when you finish at the time you go to university about a year so i spend that time teaching uh high school uh, junior high school students and just to, to 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 help with the knowledge i already had you know and then decide that i also were counseling some of them about uh what it is like being in high school so and seeing that some of my students have gone on to do well uh, to go to high school uh, to go to high school and then to college as i went to college so when i finished uh i was in college i continued to teach and then I finished college and I went to teach at the university. So is that teaching has always been just in part. Either I'm doing it informally or I'm teaching uh, from us formally. So that has been like mentoring students and also teaching. That has been part of my life. And I enjoy that because uh, there's no a greater pleasure than seeing that uh, you, you have transformed someone's life by the advice that you give them. And uh, seeing that they too, go on to other change other people's life. It's like a chain reaction. So you, you, you have helped someone uh, to improve their life, not that just one person. They also go on to teach other people. So that is at the end, helping the whole community. Yeah, and I think that's an important perspective to understand, you know, like sometimes we, we have to affect change through one person and that one person is going to have that ripple effect throughout the community. And then, uh, yeah, so, so thank you for that. And that's uh, very interesting that it goes from high school and you have to wait a year because of how, how the logistics of that works out to, to go to university, but very interesting. Is, is it very hard to get into University of Ghana or? or... So is this, uh, at the time, uh, uh, I was still in high school going, that, that was, uh, it was difficult to get in University of Ghana. It's like the best in the country. Okay. So uh, to get in there, it's hard. So yeah, but I got in. I guess I had good good grades from high school, so I, I always forget to get in. Okay, awesome, awesome. Yeah. And then after your undergrad, you went on to get a master's of science in nutrition at the University of Ghana. So you continued on at the University of Ghana. Whoa, when when in your journey did you know that you were gonna get a master's of science? So when when did that like thought come up for you? So I always knew that I was going to do a master's program sometime in my life, but I didn't plan to do it immediately. So when I finished my first degree and my undergrads, I, I wanted to, to go and work at the district health directorate, uh, just to concentrate on nutrition issues. So they, I had done internship with them before and I, I love the people that were in that uh, district and the, the staff members, some of them became lifelong friends. So I wanted to go and join them. So uh, I really enjoyed the, the, the time that I spent during my internship with them. So I wanted to go and join them. So I went back and I was there. And then uh, my undergraduate uh, uh, honest thesis supervisor, he wanted me to come back to, uh, to the university. So to, 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 to supervise his uh, research work he was doing and also be, to become a teaching assistant for him. And so uh, initially, I really didn't want to go back, but I had a lot of respect for him. And he is a great, a great mentor. And so I didn't want to disappoint him. And uh, I realized that uh, if he wanted me to be there, I know he, I, I knew he cared about me. So uh, I, I thought it was something that I should consider. So that's why I went back to university, at the university community. And I, I was there. I was the teaching assistant for him. And I also saw us in the research work that he was doing. So if you are within the university community, there are, you, 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 you just see that naturally you want to continue. Because I initially wanted to work for, let's say three, three, three years and I'll go back for the master's. But while I was on campus, I just said, well, it makes sense to just do immediately than waiting. So I, and he too, my advisor to convince me to start the master's program. So, and the people around me, they were all starting the master's program. So naturally I said, well, let me do it. So I enrolled in the master's program. Uh, it was two years. So I, I, I continued there and I, I enjoyed my time spend there uh, and I finished the master's program in nutritional science too. Okay. 
And you you said that you were a teaching assistant for that same mentor that that told you to come into the to the program. What uh, what type of teaching did you do? And I think you were also a research assistant for him as well. So to talk yeah. a little bit more about that experience. So we have uh, in in Ghana the the teaching assistant program. So when you finish uh, your first degree in Ghana, you are supposed to do what we call the national service. You have to do that for one year before you can do a master program or you can you get a job. You have to do that. It's compulsory. So if you you can do that at the university or any other other government or private organization. So I spend that time uh, assisting him in course introductory intuition courses, the course I talk about. So in, uh, I, I as a TA for that course. And we also had a, a, a field uh, nutritional status assessment aspect uh, that all the the professors in the department of nutrition they, they are involved in. So you go to the community to assess the nutrition problems in that community. So you measure their do height, weight measurement, other body composition measurement. You collect blood sample, and you also uh, uh, record their food intake. So we do a lot of things back, and the community help uh, structures and all that demographic information. We collect all that information. So then. We go back to the lab uh, for the students are put into groups to, to try to analyze the data and write report. So they write report and we go back to the community to just share with them in the form of a deba. So we spend time talking to them about the nutrition issue and health challenges in those communities. So I spent that year doing that, but he was running another research project in the, in the community that was about two hour, about one to two hours drive from our campus. So I was involved in that. I was supervising the field data collection. So we had a lot of people doing data collection. So I was in the field supervising the data collectors and then to make sure that the research were running uh, smoothly as we, we expected. So I, I did that and we're trying to understand how we can uh, uh, supplement nutrition food uh, to improve um, stress level so like how do we reduce stress so so it was supplement down with lysine it's a it's an essential macronutrient uh, so if you supplement them lysine is a protein essential uh, protein so if you supplement uh is we're we going to improve their their stress level so so i was there and it was about six i was in the field about six or so months uh for that project and uh, it ended and within a few months time i started my massive program yeah, yeah, so that that was it, and and I also was helping some of the undergraduate students that were under his mentorship. Just uh, so informally, I was guiding them, also looking at their honor thesis, what they were doing, just to guide my help my advisor and all that. So I was involved in a lot of program, and during that time, I also got it. There was uh, a side job I was doing. So uh, one professor uh, asked me to teach uh, his his daughter. So I was doing that in the evening. So after work, I'll go back to his house to teach. And uh, I had a good relationship with him when I finished school, uh, but we're, we're still in touch. So those are some of the things I did within that one, one year period before the master's program. Okay, that, that's awesome. And um, is what explain more about that. Is, you said it's a national service corps. Is that what it's called? So it's something like that. So, but this is, they call national service scheme personal service scheme so called nss so it's it's a program that is implemented by the government it, because most of the education is uh is, there's a form of subsidy in our educational system so it's a way to to give back to the country so once you finish the college you are expected to to to, to contribute to the country in a form of voluntary service so there's uh, you are serving the country in that capacity so you're not getting the full salary like you will get if you were fully employed. So you do that, they can post it to the, the remote community, but you have to go there. You can just post it to any place. So there's a, there's a national scheme that we all subscribe to in the final year. And so they will post, they will have your information and they will just post you to whatever they think there's a need. So you go and stay there for one year. Some of them go to teach in, in rural, rural community. They have never been, imagine somebody from, I create a big city and then they take you to a community. There's no light, uh, water is a problem. 
and there's no decent accommodation, but you have to stay there as part of the service to the country. So uh, I think uh, it's a good program and some people enjoy it. Uh, just giving you the opportunity to, to travel, to see what happened in other parts of the country. And some see that they have transformed life. You know, I think if you see from that perspective that you are going to not only just help the whole country, but transform individual life. If you are sent to go and teach in the rural community, they do not have teachers and you're going to help those kids who are part of the country. That, that is, there's no other service that you can talk of than helping those who are less privileged. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's awesome. That, that's a very interesting model. And I think I've, I've heard it for a couple other countries in, in a similar sense, but yeah, that, that definitely does make sense. And I think it also gives you like more of an appreciation for other parts of the country and just doing a work with groups that you might traditionally have wanted to do work for, as well as just get getting to give back to, to the larger community, which, which is awesome. So uh, th thank you for sharing that. Were there any other takeaways that you wanted to share about your Masters of Science in Nutrition? So when I started the master program, um, what I wanted to do was uh, to study cancer. So uh, I think one thing you learn is that sometimes you start a study and then realize really things don't work good the way you, 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 you plan them, or are they uh, for good or for West. So I wanted to study cancer, but when I started, I got interested in a research project on, on diabetes. So, and that came from some of the work that I did in the field during this national service program. So I used that data now to study the diabetes condition in that, in that particular community and whether they were associated with some socio demographic variables. So, uh, that, that, that was something that uh, I really enjoyed because my undergraduate is uh, an honor thesis. I was just looking at salt consumption. Now I move on to do cut uh, diabetes and the social demographic variable. So I think what I was, uh, I would say is that uh, you go in there with open mind, hoping that you do what you want, uh, you plan doing. But also take note that things could change for worse or for good, but just be open and whatever that, uh, if it, it get better, let's accept it. If it's also harder, accept the challenge and then uh, see how you can overcome that. Yeah, I like I like that. Uh, I like that a lot. That, that's that's some great advice. And I think especially going into any type of master's programs, there's so much that you're going to learn and so much transformation that happens in your life that that there could be a lot of change in perspectives and, and things like that. So I think that that's great advice to go forward. So you graduated from your master's of science and then you became a faculty member for the university uh, for development studies at, at the University of Ghana. So tell me, how, how do you get that position and what do you do? So the University of Ghana is located uh, in the capital city, Accra. Mm -hmm. So, but where I went to teach is in the northern uh, region of Ghana. So it's like, it's very far away from that. So when I was about finishing my master's, I actually wanted to do community uh, work. So to get involved in nutrition education and then how do we improve uh, nutrition status uh, in under five children. So that was my interest initially. So as I mentioned, I, I wanted to pursue that at the district level. And so I wanted to work with the Ghana Health Service. So they are in charge of uh, community health and uh, all the associated factors. That's what I initially wanted to do. But uh, before I finished, uh, one of my committee members, I uh, had uh, three people on my dissertation uh, work on master's. He called me and sat me down and said, I want you to go and teach at the University for Development Study Community Nutrition. So he emphasized that and so several times we, we, we had a discussion, he always bring up that up. So he said, well, he used to have a friend who was a senior member there. He were connected me, but the friend uh, had retired from the university, but I should just go because he, he believed what I had, uh, I, I could contribute to the university. So he said, I should just go. Uh, he doesn't even know the people that are in charge of the department and I should go. He, he believed that I could contribute to uh, the education program over there. So at the final day, he signed on my thesis work. He said, I told you to go to UDS to go and teach. <laughs> so I want to hear back from you. So that's what he said. 
So after he signed that and I had my thesis submitted, I, I traveled to the university to go and actually meet the head of the department and say, I want to teach here. So, and then uh, he asked me for my CV and all the uh, document I, I, I had prepared that, that the, the, the package, I gave it to him and I, I went away. So I went back to, uh, I went back home and I was there a while, then I went back to Accra to, they, they will mark the thesis and they will go back to correct it. So I went to correct my thesis. So I was there and I was working with one of my um, advisors, my former advisor, I was working with him on a project. Then uh, the University for Development State, the head of development asked me to come and teach. So that's how I got the job. So. Uh, so I discussed with my, my advisor that I had a job, I had to go. So I went to start teaching. So that's how I was there and I started teaching there. And I saw a vast difference between their program and the program that I did at the University for Development Studies. The, the, uh, the nutrition program at University of Ghana is broad, in, is wide in breadth, it, it's broad. So it covers different area of nutrition. But uh, the nutrition program at the University for Development Studies is focused on community nutrition. So they have depth, they have a lot of depth in community nutrition. And the students that complete their program, and if they are really serious, they, are, they come out really as well-trained, they can go to the community and they're starting running. So uh, that was a strength in that program. So I got involved in the field work. So they go to the, the students are sent to community to identify problem nutrition program uh, problems those communities. So, as a, a faculty, I will supervise them and help with the community entry. So, in our part of the, uh, of the well, so we have politicians in the community, but we also have chiefs, right? So the politicians are more for official issue, but the chiefs do have a lot of role they play in the communities. So you cannot just go to the community and start doing anything without letting them know. So you, you pass to the official channels by talking to the, uh, the district representative uh, that are the political lead, uh, element there, but you need to talk to the chiefs and religious leaders. So those were some of the things that as a faculty member with my colleague we did. So you're going to talk to the community uh, leadership that you will bring in students for this number of days, they'll be here and this is what they're going to be doing. And so, because we wanted to collaborate with the, the, the people that are already working there, so we collaborated with the, the Ghana Health Service staff, so the community health nurses uh, in the community. And so, uh, when the students uh, start the work, then things move on smoothly. So, they go in there and they, they collect demographic information. They also collect information of their physical dimension, height, weight, they measure their more uh, meet up and circumference, all those are to assess indigenous statues of uh, the community. So most of what the work today were mostly focused on kids, but also on the food available in the household and then with the women too. So those were uh, some of the things that I say I love. And I got involved with uh, the Ghana Health Service uh, trying to design a nutrition surveillance system. So to assess, uh, to track under five nutrition uh, issues in, in, the, in, the, in the catchment area that we were working in. So we, we work with the nutri uh, regional nutrition officers, district nutrition officers to design a, a surveillance system. And so that took me through to, to different regions around that area. So I'll go, uh, there were people in the field collecting the data, then I'll go and supervise them and see what they were collecting and then to, to, to just uh, also advise them. So kind of like a consultant. So we're consulting for them. So that is a high in that, uh, some of the, something that I appreciate uh, getting involved in actually solving the, the problems. And so working with them was really good. So it, it helped us start that program. And I, I hope they are still running up to, up to now. I've, I've not been in touch, but I believe that some of those elements are still in, in some form being used. They also got involved in uh, community uh, rehabilitation of malnourished children. So acute, uh, mal acute malnutrition programs. So kids that are very well malnourished, so they, 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 there's a, a food supplement that was given to them so that they will, it will improve their nutrition status. So instead of them all being in the hospital, uh, some of them can be rehabilitated at the community center. So we're providing them 
or called plumping nut, basically a very energy dense uh, nutrient source uh, that was supplemented to them. So I was part of design uh, the program and then uh, it will roll out across the country. So, so that was some of the highlights. And because I was in the community and started seeing the nutrition issues, uh, that actually caused me to think about whether I'll, uh, instead of focusing on chronic diseases like obesity, diabetes, that um, made me to move towards maternal and child health because that was a group that I was working with all the time. And I, I saw that there was a lot of issues that could be addressed. And so some of them they brought me to my undergrad training in nutrition. I could see the problem, but uh, not really very much clear because it was undergrad training, right? So an undergrad master training. So I felt that if I uh, go onto a PhD program, then I could actually zoom into that particular area. And so I was looking for a program uh, that had maternal and child health elements in nutrition. So that's how I got to Penn State. Okay, awesome, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, first thing that I wanted to highlight there is um, the the point that you have like chiefs and chiefs are like gatekeepers to the community, ensuring that nothing happens to the community without like they getting their thumbs up and saying, okay, this sounds okay. Um, and, and moving it. And I think that that in itself is like a model that that should be everywhere in some sort of way to really have those those people and those gatekeepers who are really there in community, protecting community, have community in mind and have that as the person that a researcher or just anyone coming into the community can come and talk to about the issues and how, how we can work like collaboratively to come about solutions. I wanted to ask you, because you said that you, you, you're from Accra, is, am I correct in saying that? No, I'm, I'm not from Accra. So okay. I went to school in Accra, but I'm not from Accra. Are you, are you from the north where you worked? Yes, or? I'm from the north. Okay, okay. so yeah. my, my question was going to be, so you moved, you moved from Accra to the north, where mm -hmm. it's probably a, very different from, from Accra. So how, how is that transition for you? Although it sounded like you, you got to do a lot of cool work, the school is more focused on like the community health nutrition side of things, which it seemed like that depth was something that you, you really appreciated and working alongside community was also awesome as well. So I, I think one unique thing about Ghana is that uh, no matter where you grew up, you can easily fit into other part of the country uh, because it's not a very large country that, like the United States. And you, when you, if you went to high school, you meet people from across the whole country. If you went to a big high school, you, you meet people from across the whole country that are in your high school. So you get used to uh, people from different backgrounds from you. So our high school is such that when you write the, the junior high school exam, the national is a national exam. So based on your score and the school is selected, the computer or uh, the government, the, the, the headmaster and the uh, computer system will just put you in the school that you want to. So you usually see uh, in my high school, have students from across the whole country. So, and then that's similar to most, most other high schools in the, the big high schools in the country. And so our, our school in the Upper West region, and, uh, and, but I, I came across people from, um, um, from small communities, from big communities, uh, from different regions across the country. So I got used to that. And so when I went to Accra, of course, Accra, you have people from everywhere in the country, all the corners of the country are in Accra, the school there, the university there. And then you also have um, international students there. So I got used to that. And so going back to Tamale, it was not a, going back to Northern region to teach at the university there was not a big transition because most, I'm really familiar with people. And so it's just the environment that is different. So, but I got, within a short time, I got used to that. So okay. it, was not, it was not a big transition for me. Okay, and, that, and that, that makes sense. And then that, that's some awesome work. And like, I liked how you, you concluded all that work. And then you said you were looking for like more maternal and child nutrition types of programs. And that's how you ended up at Penn State University. So you got your PhD in maternal and child nutrition with a minor in statistics at Penn State University. We, so you said that, uh, and you said earlier that maternal and child health brought you to the USA. So was it that you were just looking for maternal and child health PhD programs across the world, maybe in Africa, Europe, and the US? Or what, what, how do you go about looking for those type of programs? So I was looking at uh, maternal and child health nutrition programs uh, in the US and UK. Uh, because 
uh, these are the, some of the best places you can get your nutrition degree from. And so that's why I, I look at it too. But I'm more focusing on the US because the US just have a lot of good programs in nutrition, nutrition sciences. So uh, they have a good program, but our actual, if you look at the department, you will see what they actually do in nutrition because there's a wide breadth and then some de department do not have a lot of expertise in those areas. So I was actually looking for that particular concentration. And so that brought me to Penn State. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, what, what was that transition like for you going from Ghana, going into Penn State? It was huge. <laughs> it was huge. <laughs> uh, a huge transition. It was and life changing. You know, um, my first experience of snow was in, <laughs> in, in Penn State. You know, you see that in science, you talk about changing of uh, matter state, right? Uh, ice melting and all those vapor, you see a transition, right? But you, that, those are just pictures you see. But when you actually see the snow dropping, it's, it's a very different experience, right? So the first few snow, you love it. Then after <laughs> the, the cold comes, right? You don't like that aspect. So you have to wear a lot of clothing, heavy clothing, cover yourself just to go on. It, it was a big challenge, you know, uh, just because our weather is constant throughout the year with the manner of fluctuation, otherwise it's, it's constant and it's a bit hot there. So coming to a very cold environment, uh, it was, that, that was the major transition. And then food. So the food are very different. You know, here people eat a lot of bread, bread in a different form, other in baguettes, whatever, but it's always bread, right? So we don't eat a lot of bread. People mostly eat bread for breakfast, right? But that's not part of a traditional meal. So food, food and the weather were the main uh, transition that I had to face. So in the first year, it was, it was hard on me. It was really hard. But you know, after the first year, you get used to things and already you have already bought the heavy clothing and you just store them for the next season. You take them back <laughs> to wear them. So, and, and the food, you, you start getting gradually getting used to the breads, a different vari variation of breads. And then, yeah, you, 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 before, you get fine with the time. <laughs> so that was the biggest transition for me, the weather and the food. Yes, the weather and the food. Okay, and I completely, completely could understand that. That, that, that is a big, big change. Um, so, so like to that point, what advice would you give to someone that's coming from a completely different country, completely different culture and coming into the U.S. to, to be able to support themselves and thrive throughout, throughout their time transitioning here? So, uh, I, I, well, I'll, I'll talk about the academic aspect, but let me talk about things that are not academic first. So I think that once you're moving to a, a different country, uh, you should just expect that things will not be as it is in your country. Okay, uh, it doesn't mean they are bad, but probably that's just how people live their life. You know, for instance, uh, in Ghana, people like chatting. So somebody will see you suddenly and they come and start chatting with you, it's normal. Then the US is not like that. People just want to have their peace of mind. Why are you talking to me? I don't even know you. <laughs> so it's, it's a very different thing altogether. You know, I know it's very across the country, but generally people just want to mind their business. You know, for us, we will mind your business for you. So we, we just come and start chatting with you, whether you like it or not. Your roommate, your friends will come and they, they will engage you. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's just different. People just move. Here, you come to realize that people want to be in their own corner. So they just want to, to take care of themselves. Don't bother them. So there are some that would like to engage, but you need to, to study them to see whether they, are, they want to engage. If they don't want to engage with you, it doesn't mean they're bad people, that's just their nature. So you have to understand things that way. I think it's much easier for you as an international student to, to make friends with another international student. It is very likely that you share a lot of common story, even though you are from different countries, you share similarities, uh, like somebody from Ghana, India, you'll be surprised to see that we share so many things in common about life in general. 
And you can always start by talking about the, uh, the transition together, right? You all transition from different countries. So it's a common uh, uh, starting point. You can start chatting from there. And it, you, you find that a lot of people welcome that kind of conversation. But with time, then you, as you get to understand your American friends, you will begin to have American friends too. Just try to understand that they're different from you. That's just how it is. It's not that they, uh, they are strange, just that, that how they live. They probably see you as strange too, because that's, you are coming from a different country and your way of life is different. So just try to understand them. And then I think you, you, you have good friends you know, over time. And the weather is going, depending on where you school, for instance, if you are in the Midwest or the Eastern part of the country, like uh, Penn State area, it's really cold. So when you go, you start buying your clothing. Don't wait until the first snow. You know, talk to people around you. They will tell you what kind of clothing you buy. Because when I went at first, they told me to buy coats. I bought a coat, but it was very light. Because I didn't understand how cold it's going to be like. So I bought a very lighter one, and then to me, it's, 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 it give me heat. But the first one, I realized, no, this is not going to cut it. <laughs> so I had to actually go to buy a heavy one. Then I just start from there. So I think talking to a lot of people are very nice. They will, they will tell you what kind of uh, clothing you should buy uh, for, for the winter. And you can even talk to international students who have been there for two, three years, and they have gone through the cold weather. So getting those clothing, I think that's the first thing you should get them ready. Because when the weather is cold, you cannot even go out to do anything, right? But you need to go for lectures. So you don't want that to prevent you from attending classes and doing what you're supposed to do or going to lab. So get the clothing ready and the food, you'll be fine. Okay, the food, you'll be fine. So just, you may not enjoy at the beginning, but try gradually. And then if you have the local food, fine. But there are some places like uh, Penn State, you will not get a lot of local food. Of course, you get a restaurant that are Indian, Chinese restaurant, you, you get those ones. But we didn't have anything like from Africa origin food. So, but you can get that from some store, some of the local stores that are in town, you can get uh, food from your country or something similar to what you are used to in your country. You start from there, but try eating, just eat what is available in the, in the state, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going to be here for a while, you just get used to that. So try starting gradually and over time, you'll be fine. Okay, awesome. And um, what advice would you give on the academic side? So uh, the academic side, uh, you, at first, you'll be, you, you'll be intimidated. You, you'll be intimidated because uh, maybe how uh, courses were taught in your country are really very different. So here, in the semester, they'll give you a, a whole book for the course. This is what we're going to run, and you run into the whole book for the, the semester, right? So we don't do that. We may, uh, we may cover a lot in the, in the book, but like it mostly rely on the professor. We don't have all the textbooks that you have here that you can just get and use. We don't have that. So you mostly rely on what is provided the professor and then a uh, few other sources. So be prepared that you spend some money, okay? <laughs> that you spend some money getting the textbooks. Uh, but if you follow, you should be fine. It, it looked daunting at the beginning, but you'll be fine in the end. Okay, awesome, awesome. Well, thank, thank you for sharing those, those insights and advice around transitioning to the U.S. I definitely think someone listening to this is going to find that valuable and useful to, to their path and their journey as well. So while you were doing your PhD, you were a graduate research assistant. Um, so what, what type of research did you do? And, and I guess like this could lead into like, what was your dis dissertation around and, and different things like that? Yeah. So, so the research assistant, uh, well, it's research, right? So you support a faculty research in the sciences that hard. You, you are part of a, a lab. So a lab basically is a group. So the, the, there's a director, which is usually your advisor or a senior faculty member. It could, there could be two faculty members in the same lab or just one faculty member. So I was working in my advisor lab. So they pay you. So they pay your, your stipend and then they will pay for your research and all that. So that's the research you do. So I support the research in the lab. So when I started at first, I was studying my, uh, mice. So we're trying to see supplementing vitamin D, whether that uh, could improve 
plastic, uh, implantation uh, in mice. So that is what I studied uh, the first year. That's why I spent my time on just uh, on that. By the second year, I, I, I went to back to Ghana to start a research pro project there. So it is just studying now the human studies. So looking at women that were planning to get pregnant, we're trying to measure their nutrition status. So collect blood sample, measure out a lot of macronutrient markers in the blood sample. Then also I said the food security situation in that community and we call it a lot of health and demographic variable. So I went to start that project. We collaborated with the University of Ghana, a, a professor from the University of Ghana. So I went back, like I mentioned, to, um, to work with the chiefs, community leaders, uh, opinion religious leaders, and the health, uh, uh, health official in that community uh, to start the project, just to get it informed. Then I hired research staff for data collection. So I had all the logistics in place, then the research got started. I was there for a while. Once everything was moving well, then I came back to continue my studies. So I went during the summer. So I, that was really interesting. So I spent my summer there. But before starting that, during the, the early part of the summer, I went to Norway. So Norway had this summer research program uh, that usually occur in, uh, in June, July. So where they have PhD students and early career scientists, uh, professionals, uh, PhD, PhD students and assistant professors, those in the early phase of career, to come and focus on one single important issue. So our, our time we're focusing on SDGs, but there were different tracks. Some were focusing on the environment and uh, our man track, we were focused on maternal and child health issues. So it was two weeks, very intensive. It was supposed to be a month, but they had to put it in just in two weeks. So it was, it was demanding. So we covered a lot. And some of the professors, they had done a lot of work in Africa and Asia, South America. So we have a professor from across the whole world coming to teach that program. But there was a main professor that we had classes every day. So it was so like the whole day you are in class doing assignment, doing group work. So it was intensive. But I made a lot of friends from there. And then some of us, we sit chat today. So that was a good aspect. Yeah, and then it also gave me an opportunity to see what happened in Europe about so they do research and just meeting people there was fun. Yeah, that, that definitely sounds like an awesome experience. And yeah, again, getting to go to Norway and meeting a bunch of people and trying to solve issues with uh, a lot of different smart people sounds like a cool way to, to spend some of your PhD time as well. And, and as well as you being able to go back to Ghana and get a lot of the, the data and research stuff started for, for a lot of the work that you were doing back in the US. Um, so how, how did you, what, what was your dissertation around and then how do you come up with that, that specific topic? So my dissertation was around uh, measuring uh, or optimizing methods to measure nutritional biomarkers. So we're looking at pregnancy and then uh, non-pregnant women. So the first part of research I was focusing on uh, evaluating the changes in blood volume during pregnancy. It's, I don't know why it sounds more technical. I don't know, it's gonna break it down. So basically when women are pregnant, there's an increase in the volume of blood. And so if the volume is increasing and then the nutrients are changing there. So how do we assess that? So that was the first part, just seeing how the volume uh, volume, plasma volume change across time during pregnancy. Then I developed a method to actually measure the volume changes, uh, the, uh, the volume, uh, plasma volume. So as part of that, I developed that method. Uh, there have been methods that are used, but some of those methods are no longer available. And some of them cannot be used in pregnant women. So the, the, so the rationale of the developed method that is safer and a method that the volume that is needed is also smaller. So we don't use a lot of uh, blood to measure uh, plasma volume. So that was the, the, the idea of that project. So I developed the method. And then we tried to see during the menstrual cycle, you no, know, there are a lot of changes occurring in the menstrual cycle, right? And so those changes could have an uh, impact on how these uh, biomarkers are, are measured. 
So we track the changes in the volume and we track the changes in the macronutrient biomarkers across the menstrual cycle. So that was my dissertation. So uh, I, I spent a lot of time recruiting uh, women and then it was a very stringent criteria and uh, getting participants to, to, to get involved in that. Yeah. Was that specific to the US or was that both in the US and Ghana? So that was in the US, that was in the US. Okay, awesome, awesome. Were there any other key takeaways or, or cool things that you think people would, would find interesting? I think uh, the cool takeaway is that uh, there's uh, some of the markers divided across the menstrual cycle. And so as a public health person or a clinician, what you should think about is that if these markers are changing across the cycle, that means that there's a potential that if someone comes to the hospital and you take the blood and measure that macronutrient, the same person, if they come at a different phase, you get a different value. And so there could be intervention that are not needed or where there's intervention, and, but it was not given, though they are needed. So we are trying to see, that's an area that has not been well exploited. So we are trying to see uh, what is the correct timing to actually measure these uh, biomarkers uh, to show that either for public health use or for clinical use. So that is something that I'm still interested in continuing to, uh, to explore. But what we found is that uh, the cycle can have an impact on how you, uh, the values of these biomarkers, and that could have an effect on how we interpret it and how they are used. That, that is very interesting. And I feel like it has a lot of implications for a, a lot of maternal health things that we do right now. Uh, so so thank, thank you for doing that work. And uh, hopefully people are, are more aware of this, uh, especially clinicians who, who are working with um, pregnant mothers to, to really understand that there's a nuance to this depending on the cycle and, and really understanding that and, and approaching that with a holistic view. Um, so I appreciate that. Okay, so currently you're a postdoctoral, postdoctoral research associate at Iowa State University. So okay. what is the process for looking and getting a postdoctoral research associate position? So, so the postdoctoral research situation is different from uh, the doctoral process. So the doctoral process, you are a student. So you are depending on your advisor to get things done and so that you get a degree, right? And you are almost focused on one particular area aligned with that of your advisor because they need to supervise you. So with the, when you're going, into the postdoc, you are trying to look for one specific area that you are interested in, because it's usually shorter than the PhD. Most PhD programs are filled around five years, right? So by the postdoc, uh, you don't want to, to stay there for a very long time, right? So mostly two to three years. So you want to focus on something that you can do. And you look, so you look for an expert in the field of that area they are interested in then you, 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 go into, uh, you go into the lab to join. So first you must see whether they have funding, whether they are interested in taking a postdoc. So these are two big factors. Do they have funding? Are they taking a postdoc? But first, of, of course, you want to work under that person. That's why you, you, you are even thinking about them in the first place. Yeah, so I think the first thing is uh, to first identify what you want to do uh, the advice I got during my PhD was that you do a postdoc in something different from your PhD so that it broadens your scope. And then you also do it in a different institution so that you want to have another form of experience from the same, I forgot you work with for five years to get a PhD, you want to get it from a different environment. So that was uh, the advice that I got. So that's how I, I look for a faculty with the faculty interest in iron metabolism. So and that's how I, 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 so basically focus on iron metabolism. So here my research is focused on iron metabolism and obesity. So uh, I have done some bit of macronutrients, so iron was involved, but this one I focus more in, uh, in, in depth of study of iron metabolism. 
and looking at obesity. So that's what I've, I've been studying for the past two and a half years. Okay, awesome. So you, 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 start, a, you start ahead of time looking for the position before you, you, you define your thesis. So that by the time you, you, your thesis is done, then you, you have a job to go and start. But there's a difficulty here for international students. So if you are a US citizen, you don't have a problem. Once you get a job, you can go and start working. With an international student, you have to wait until you get uh, approval from the government. So there's uh, a, a, a employment uh, authorization. So you apply and then the government um, will issue you a card. And so that card is what you allow you to work. So, and so in my case, I got a job, I came here and I was waiting for the card to appear. So I was here, I had a job or I was reported, but I couldn't officially start the work until I received the card. So I was here for a while, then I see the card and I continue, I continue working. So, uh, but the, so there's a timeline, you, can, you should submit your, your document to the government. And then uh, you cannot, if you don't get a job within some time frame after finishing, then you have to leave the country. So I think it's about 90 days or so after um, you, 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 uh, you, you graduate. So that is a bit hard for international students. Yeah, but you have to, that's to somebody. So that's why you have to plan ahead of time to apply as many as possible. So you get a place to start with. I think Americans, they have more flexibility. If they don't get a job, they can stay home and just look for what they want. And that's say, if you are international, you don't have that lawsuit, you must get a place within a short time. So, so you should start looking for the place ahead of time before you, you actually submit your thesis, yeah. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, that, that definitely a, a little bit inequitable, but um, what, what you're gonna do, right? Um, yeah. Just have to plan ahead for that. So, so what, what, what was that process for you? Because you said, you said that you got advice from a mentor to do your postdoctoral in something that's a little bit different from your PhD so you can broaden your scope. Mm -hmm. So why, why do you want to go into understanding more about like iron deficiencies and obesity, iron met metabolism and, and So obesity. iron deficiency is the most common nutritional problem in the world. So, and it affects uh, almost uh, every country have a problem. In the US here is the, is, if you look at the macronutrient we have, it's the most uh, important public health problem nutritionally, uh, macronutrient problem in the US. So particularly in women of childbearing age, so about, about one, in, one in 10 women in the US here, they have iron, iron deficiency. And during pregnancy, even get worse. So it's a problem here. And then obesity is a problem. So obesity, uh, uh, you've seen people already, so you don't have to measure them, but I see, what can I see a lot of people that are bigger than this, they, they, are, they are comfortable with, right? So they have a lot of people with obesity and then you have uh, iron deficiency. It's a big problem in women of childbearing age and adult in general. Iron deficiency, uh, uh, obesity can affect uh, your iron status, your iron metabolism. So that's why I joined the two. Because I'm interested in maternal and child health, but if the iron deficiency can actually affect uh, maternal health and obesity can affect maternal health, what happens if they had the two of them are together? So that's why I've been studying. So women that are matern uh, matern or reproductive age, they are obese. What is the iron metabolism like? How can we improve that? Uh, maternal and child health is something that if we can improve, we'll be saving a lot of population. And then uh, you're, not, you're also improving, you're improving the child health, the mother's health, because iron deficiency can have a long-term effect, even in cognitive development of uh, the child, it can have long-term effect on cognitive development, and then the work capacity in adult age. So you want to have a, a healthy workforce, you start with good nutrition. You want to have good nutrition, you have to take care of your, your mothers. You take care of your mothers, then you, have, you give birth to healthy, heavy babies. And if you take care of that, 
you have healthy adults, and you have healthy workforce, you improve your public health. That is so true. That is so true. And, and it, like just simply putting it like that, I think is, is important for people to see. And I, I think a lot of policy makers don't, don't see the importance of that or like just the importance of investing in this type of work. Because as you said, the, the, uh, the return on investment is like phenomenal for, for this type of investment, but it just takes a long time to, to see the, the outcomes that are there. But as we know, it, it is a very important time uh, to, to catch when people are pregnant, as well as like when, when kids are being born and when they're young to, to ensure that they are getting started on a solid path to, to have the best health and, and just to, to thrive throughout their life. So I appreciate you sharing that as well. I think for your post postdoctoral um, research associate position, you had to get trained in good clinical practice. So just tell me a little bit about that. So, uh, so the work we do in the lab, uh, they involve a lot of health issues. So you need to, there are a lot of training that you do in order to operate in the lab. We got your safety, uh, the people that you work with their safety and the participants, the research subject, yeah, their safety. So those are some of the training that you do just to ensure that the people that you are working with, they are safe and then, uh, they are using the, the right tool to do the right job. So th th that's just part of the training that you get, you, 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 you get in order to, to be allowed to work in the field. So you have training that will take care of, like the love hazard issues. Uh, they are training that are focused on ethics. So like clinical, um, are you recruiting people fairly? Are you concentrating on just one particular group of people? That is not uh, fair. So you are not bedding one particular group. You are making it equitable. So, so those are ethic issues. So you, you want to treat the participants fairly. You treat, uh, if there's any issue that come up, you need to report it. So for them not to what, know what they are getting involved in. You spell out the risks. If there are any risks that are involved or any harm, what are the benefits? What are they going to get? If they're not going to get anything from that research, you need to tell them. So these are things that you, 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 you are trained in. And if you're in the lab, you have to know the hazards that are involved, like a fire extinguishers, where do you exit if there's fire? How do you take care of chemicals and all that? So those are some of the training that you, uh, that you would do. Okay, okay. That, that, that makes sense. And that definitely thing is important. Um, did you want to talk more about the influence on maternal obesity and diabetes on excessive fetal growth? Yeah, so this is uh, uh, a large data set that I'm working on. So this is from a uh, nutrition surveillance program that's run by the US uh, government, CDC. So they track uh, the uh, pregnant women uh, issues that happened before during pregnancy and after. And so I'm looking at that data, particularly looking at women that are obese and then they had diabetes either before or during pregnancy because the outcome could be different. Obesity in itself has an effect on the, the, the size of the baby that will be delivered then a diabetes also has an impact. So I'm looking at, if you combine these two conditions, what will happen? Or is it a threat on the baby? And so what you see is that uh, the babies are bigger. And so having bigger babies, you want to have normal sized babies. You don't want to have them thin, that's a problem. But you don't want to have them big because that's a problem. Uh, other delivery, they can have a uh, broken clavicle. Uh, it has a high risk for CS and then uh, the high mortal mortality rates other the mother and the fetus. So there are a lot of health complications. And if the baby is born that big, the chance that they will also they grow out to be big adolescents is high. And then it's like they will become obese in adult and the cycle will continue. So obese kids, it give birth, uh, grow to become obese, uh, 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 adolescent, obese adult, they deliver an obese child. So that cycle, and then if you combine with diabetes, it's just a disaster. 
So most of the studies that are always, they were focusing on uh, gestational diabetes, right? Because during pregnancy, they test it, let you see. But there are some that had diabetes before they become pregnant. So, and that we see that that has even worse outcomes. So if they have diabetes, it just, things just get worse and then the babies are much bigger. So that's, that, so that's we are trying to, to see, uh, uh, to, to explain what's going on. And, and there have been studies that show that if grandmothers are obese, their granddaughters were obese too. So very large studies have shown this uh, using data from the UK. So that grandmothers obese and then the granddaughters are obese. So, and the, the, data, the data is showing that the obese alone, the kids are uh, then likely to give birth to uh, babies that were bigger and then our diabetes alone to the same outcome. But if you combine them, then it's just too, too many big babies that are going to be born. So we think that as part of education for women that are trying to get pregnant, those are some issues, instead of just talking about macronutrient, which you are interested in, uh, because we have a lot of um, benefit if they take them. We think that understanding um, your diabetes status or your blood sugar level before getting pregnant is important. You need to control that before you get pregnant because you want to have a healthy, a bad outcome. And uh, if they develop it during pregnancy, that is also need to be controlled. But if you control, or uh, if you are obese, it also increases your risk of becoming diabetic. So that's a problem. So uh, educating women to actually, if they can reduce their weight, it's hard, you know, reducing weight is really very hard. But if they look at, if they see that that's something they can do, or they're willing to do before they get pregnant, it has benefit for the mother, they also have benefit for the child that they will love. Right, so that is something trying to reduce weight and then uh, controlling blood sugar level uh, is important before pregnancy and during pregnancy. Well, I, I did not know that, so I appreciate you sharing that. And I wanted to ask, is it uh, similar for like gestational diabetes versus just regular diabetes that people have or how, is there any, any difference there? So gestational diabetes is the diabetes that uh, occur during the pregnancy. So we have that. But also had people that had diabetes before they became pregnant. So that like a kind of uh, uh, chronic diabetes. So it's, it's there, it's not the pregnancy that's, uh, it's not resulting from the pregnancy, but it's, or it's already been there. Okay. So the two of them that we're trying to look at, and we think both of them are important that should be controlled uh, to have healthy bad outcomes. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Well, well thank, thank you for sharing that. Um, and then before I move you on to the last section of the show, I wanted to ask you, where would you like to see yourself in the future? I love teaching. So I mentioned this at the beginning. I love teaching. So I, I want to see myself teaching the university. I love teaching. I love research. So I, I just love how you get, your, get to doing the research and then see how you can use that research. To, and if I were to translate that, how you can improve public health. So I like to do research and teach. So that's what I want to spend my time doing from here. Awesome, awesome. awesome. It sounds like you got that figured out and you're definitely on a path where you're able to do a lot of research and important research as well as uh, teach. So, so that's awesome to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, so moving on to the last section, the Furious Five, the five questions I ask all guests. Number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? I think public health is a broad area. Uh, they, should, they should look at what area of public health they want to pursue. And if they love to help people and to, and to make community healthier, I think public health is the right direction for them. Awesome. Number two, if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? Okay, so my position as a postdoc or the research that I do. So if it's a postdoc position, I would say if the person is a PhD student, of course, you need to be a PhD student, then you, from there you become a postdoc. So at, uh, you should start early. Uh, if your PhD is if you're about a year to uh, year and a half to a year to finish your PhD program, 
you should start looking for the positions. Uh, start looking for the position because time ran fast. And then if you don't start preparing, then you get to a point you are concentrating on your station work. It takes a lot of time to get to the final part of the station and then getting people work and all that. So you should start early and start looking at where you want to do the postdoc position at. Who do you want to work with? You know, these are important questions. So sometimes some people are just looking for the institution, but there are some that are also looking for the expertise, their uh, expertise. And so if the person you are looking to work with may not be at a big university, but you like the very interesting research that they are doing. Okay, and some want to work with a more experienced faculty. So uh, senior faculty, some have been there for a long time. That's what they are looking to work with. And uh, so, and some really don't care. You know, so these are things that you, 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 you want to think about ahead of time. And once you figure that out, then you start looking for uh, where you want to submit the application to and who you want to contact. That's great advice. Um, number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? So I currently I'm part of uh, a training program for early career and graduate students, early career professional and graduate students. So it's a leadership training program. So it's a year long pro training program that is run by the, the, the college, the graduate college. It's something that I really love because uh, leadership when we see leadership, often we look at it for our CEOs. That's how we all see leadership. But we are all leaders in, in, our, in our small circle of friends or family, wherever we find ourselves. We don't have to hold a title leader to effect change. So wherever you find yourself, see what you can do to contribute to the group. That is leading. And then, so the training, Part of the first training that we had was looking at people's strengths. You know, you have to identify your strengths and see how do you maximize that? Because there, there have been a lot of reliance on people trying to address their weaknesses. That's good. But if we focus on addressing people's strengths, let's magnify the strengths, okay? So let's use this analogy. You are good in math. And then you are probably not good in art, but you want to do both. And you are putting a lot of time in art. Why don't you put a lot of time in, this, in, the, in, the, in the math that you can bring a lot of big changes, okay? Maybe after some time, you can then start looking at um, the art. But that is a part of learning is focusing on your strengths. Uh, first, identify that, and then you, you try to um, exemplify, see how you can use that to your benefit and to the benefit of whatever you find yourself in. Yeah. So that's what I do. And I'm also taking a lot of courses uh, uh, on Coursera, on statistics, and then on LinkedIn, there's also training program, just other professional uh, training programs that I'm taking uh, that are uh, in line with the, uh, the things that I'm interested in, other um, uh, communication skills, uh, leadership, and then working with people in general is hard. So just learning all these skills, how to work with people is, is something that I enjoy. Yeah. yeah, awesome, awesome. Thank you for sharing that as well. Um, and then number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Um, so I listen to TED Talks, TED Talks. So there are a lot of books people can read, but like people don't have a lot of time. <laughs> so what I would comment is that, uh, TED Talks, they are brief, but have powerful messages. You know, they are about 80 minutes. But if you finish watching, spending that 80 minutes on YouTube, on TED Talks, you will learn a lot. So you, I, I just listen to Ken Robinson uh, talk. Ken Robinson, Ken Robinson talk on, do, do school kill creativity? Do school kill creativity uh, by Ken Robinson. Okay. And then the, uh, the second one is the danger of a single story. The danger of a single story. I think I've seen that one. By Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, the first time I listened to that, I was blown away. We all have single stories about people that we work with, about uh, other countries. People are not just one way. So if we listen to you, people have 
multiple di dimensions. So you should think about people as that big, and not just um, one stereotype. So th that's uh, that's something I recommend. Awesome, awesome. And I'll link those in the uh, show notes for anyone that's interested in checking those out. Um, and then last but not least, where can people connect with you? Connect with me via LinkedIn. Awesome, awesome. And I'll also leave that in the show notes as well as the description under the podcast. So you can just click there and connect. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Sixer Seguri, for coming on and, and sharing your insights and your information. This was a really fun conversation for myself and I learned a lot, so I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Omar, for giving me the opportunity to, to chat with you and to share with your audience. Truly, truly is my pleasure. So housekeeping items, uh, thank you everyone for listening to this episode or watching it. Be sure to subscribe if you have not subscribed as yet. Be sure to leave a five-star review and let me know what you think about the show. Um, to leave a like if you're watching this on YouTube and share it with a friend so other people can really get navigate their public health story just a little bit better. If you'd like to support, you can go to the public health the phmillennial.com forward slash support and support there. Thank you all for tuning in today.